Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF in this special series sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard along with my co-host Tracy Hazard and today we're going to talk about 3D printing jobs in a really good update from a great episode that we did before. Yeah, we interviewed Jennifer Killingback from Daniels Global, which is one of the worldwide, I mean, they have offices all over, um, placement and recruiting agency for 3D printing jobs. And, you know, they have a good perspective on how things are going, how things are moving through the marketplace, what shifts are happening and what the types of jobs. And we interviewed Jennifer and she just was so insightful into everything. But one of the things that I really want you to, you're going to listen to it and she's got some great tips and great information on how to apply, how to be right for being hired, right? Like all of those things in there. So when we're moving out of this education episodes that we've just done, and now we're moving into like how that applies to the future, right? And how that applies to jobs. But we also do want to put this in perspective with like what's really going on in the world today. And like, is this still viable? They are keeping their website updated. They have a great blog there. They have white papers and other things. So we invite you to go to Daniel's Global. All the links for that and how you can get there is in the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. And really check that out because when you're checking out this episode matters because things are uh, changing monthly, sometimes weekly around <laughs> this industry right now. So really make sure you're keeping that updated. You know, one of the things we want to share with you here before we, you know, bring this episode back because it is still very relevant today, but there are some things that have changed and, and need to be updated. And it's not the demand for hiring in the 3D print industry, you know, that, that's certainly still very high, but what employers are looking for skill-wise, what they were looking for when we recorded this and what they're looking for today, there have been some shifts in that. And it's very notable. We want to share that with you right now. Yeah. So the World Economic Forum put out a list of the, I'm going to call them the top skills. And these are qualities, not just skills, even though that's what they called them. Um, and they're, they're needed to thrive in that, what we've been calling industry, i.e., right? Um, industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, whichever way you want to call it. But, you know, we're looking at that and, and what has changed over the years. So in 2015, when they put out their first report, it's really interesting. The top three things were complex problem solving, coordinating with others, and people management. That that's what they were valuing. Yet, they're talking about hiring engineers. And so it's an interesting kind of idea that that's what was valued at that time. But today we look at 2020 and the values have shifted and what has moved up the list significantly is complex problem solving still at the very, very top, but critical thinking and creativity are coming at one, two, and three. And so like looking at that model, we're seeing that the values of the things that Many of us who have design educations, art educations, we have uh, engineering educations, like all of those things, we're getting into this creative world um, with critical thinking processing going on. And the other thing that has happened is there's a new add to the list called cognitive flexibility. And it's a term that I really like. Um, it's something that I did an interview with Shane Snow, who's one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called Smart Cuts. You will love it. It's, a, it's fabulous. We'll put links to that in the blog post as well. But Cognitive Flexibility is a part of it, actually his newest book, which is about building a dream team. And when you want to build dream teams, cognitive flexibility is where innovation can still happen. And that's why we want it. We want to be able to think in an open-minded way but not in so open-minded that we're wishy-washy and we'll just, you know, go whichever way the opinion flows, right? <laughs> we want to have that flexibility to be able to take an opinion, work it through in our minds and be cognitively flexible to shift our viewpoint and perspective so that we can stay innovative. And that's a valuable, a valuable trait that they've highlighted in this 2020 World Economic Forum skill report. You know, Tracy, one of the things I found most fascinating about the difference in this, you know, these skills that employers are seeking from 2015 to 2020 is the fact that quality control that was right in the middle of the pack of the list is now no longer on the list at all. And I think that actually 
speaks volumes. Its absence in this top 10 list speaks volumes because it shows you a shift away from maybe the tech or technician side of jobs and the need around 3D print related jobs. Again, more toward the critical thinking and the creativity, which is going to help 3D print jobs produce, you know, help companies produce products that are going to be received more in the real world and in the marketplace today. So uh, to me, it, it, this is not a shocker to me. To me, this is a very good sign and a hopeful sign for the future of 3D print jobs being more widely adopted and more mainstream. Right. And, you know, here's the thing. It's like, I really look at this list also, and I'm seeing an ad that's going to probably happen within the next year. They don't really put this report out every year, but I wish they did. But we're going to see a shift to something virtual communication skills are going to be a strength that is required. Like, am I able to still convince people? Am I able to still communicate uh, with passion and with um, ability to influence, right? Um, to win friends and influence people, right? How am I able to do that to get them on my path when I'm not in the office with them? And because we're moving out into such a remote working environment, especially in our tech companies right now, we're moving into that world in a post-COVID environment. As we get back into these office spaces, our ability to communicate at that high level is, is going to be a new add to this list. I'm, 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 I'm convinced of it. We just aren't seeing it right here. But you know, interesting because active listening was the other thing that dropped off the list. And that is something that you do need to do when you're on, when you're on a, virtual, a virtual conference call or anything like that. Active listening needs to happen in order for you to be influentially communicative, right? And so be able to do those two things as well. So I think that one might make a comeback. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's still an important skill. And, and of course, this list in 2010 was produced before COVID-19 and right. before all these tech companies like Twitter and, and Facebook have said they're going to allow more, if not all their employees to work from home. But I, I'm sure active listening is still on the list. It just may not be the top 10. But what's interesting is it's fallen below a lot others that are, I guess, more important critical factors for this particular job. Maybe active listening is going to be a very important thing for all jobs, but it's not a key distinguishing factor for 3D print jobs more than it might be for others. Yeah. And you know, a couple of things that I just want, how can you ensure that you're up to speed and employable in 3D related fields, right? How, how are you going to find those 3D printing jobs? It's just one aspect in that Daniels Global and, and Jennifer Killingback are going to talk about in the episode. That's just one aspect, but you also have to skill up and be sure that you're ready and demonstrating that at any given time. And this is something that I was just counseling and mentoring someone who was looking out there looking for work. And I said to him, go out, produce video every single day. It doesn't have to be long, produce a video, teach something, you know, convince somebody of something, put, figure out what it is. It doesn't even have to be 100% related to exactly what you expect your job to be in. And, you know, show knowledge in the 3D print industry if that's what you want, right? You know, if that's where you're going for that, for the type of job. But going out there and proving that I can get on the technology that I'm capable of getting on Zoom or getting on, you know, whatever the WebEx or, or whatever you, you're using, right? Yeah, that I can get on those things, that I can go out there, that I can put out a video, I can communicate well, I'm already demonstrating that I have one of the skills on the list, right? That I, I have the ability to do that. But then the other thing is that when you show up day after day after day or week after week, if you only do this once a week, but if you show up, consistency and constancy is a value. They want, we wanna know that you're gonna, as employers, that you're gonna show up, right? Even when you're virtual, that you're showing up for us, right? That you understand the value of that commitment level. So thinking about some of those things, how can I demonstrate this? to employers, future employers, not just how can I put that on my resume? Because these skills are not something that's easily read. And that's the struggle. So I interviewed Adobe. I was at their big conference, the Adobe Max conference, and I interviewed Adobe and talked to them about these same things. And this is what they were saying is that they were struggling to find a way to review applicants to assess these same skills from the World Economic Forum that they knew were strong and important. And so, and they were having difficulties doing that because it doesn't come across, it's not a keyword, 
It doesn't show up from an AI that's searching through and rem resumes and sending them to you because it's not one of the keywords you search for, right? So unless someone had relevant past experience in one of those things that would, or they knew them, it's, you know, it wasn't helping them find great hidden talent. So that's where you really going out there and adding these multimedia components, maybe in some cases, but adding them to your resume balance of things of what you've got helps me find you explore and, and you're right there in front of me and I want to hire you. Hey, Tom. Absolutely. So we're talking 3D printing jobs, but we're not just talking it. We're talking about 3D related jobs, right, Tom? Right. Because, you know, there are lots of sales jobs, marketing jobs, mm. like all these kinds of support functions that need to have understanding of 3D printing, but they maybe aren't best served by having the skill set of having been engineers or other things. These other skills require different types of people, right? So we need to think of broader in our team. And, and Jennifer Killingback does bring some of that up as their, their broadness of what they are looking for in terms of jobs that they're out there searching for and recruiting for are broad. They're not just engineers, right? Yeah, um, they're no not question. just designers, right? Yeah. You know, there's a broadness to that. But that's really where at the end of the day, really thinking about this and how I can express if I'm not in a 3D print related job already, but I'm interested in moving into sales and 3D printing or moving from an engineering world that's not in 3D printing, but I want to shift into that. How can I demonstrate some interest and some experience and some passion about it that, that then I can still use all of the great things on my resume or my sales side or my marketing side, right? And so finding those two ways to do that, this is a broader look at how we're doing this. It's not just resumes today. And that's really critically important. And the last thing I want to bring up is that something that I just got some experience with there are some tools going out. You know, we've used um, with our, our friend Bill Sterley, we've used um, the Herman Brain Dominance Program. And there's, you know, there's lots of them out there. There's a new one that I just heard about called the Genius Factor that many companies, including some really big financial management companies, are looking at bringing in and screening all of their workers through. I'll put a link to that in the blog post for this episode. Um, and uh, because I happen to meet the founder of it, um, and she's amazing. And so and this is a really interesting kind of ideas. Also, some of these things where you might screen yourself and put yourself through this ahead of time. Or maybe if you're in the hiring side of things, you might want to put all your people through it because sometimes we cannot always assess these skills straight out of a resume. That's a really good point, Tracy. We're going to put this list in yeah. the blog post so we that you can to. see the full list. So you can see the comparison between 2020 and 2015. So that'll be in the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. And, you know, let's go listen to Jennifer Killingback. So we've got Jennifer Killingback from Alexander Daniels Global. They are a specifically niche additive manufacturing recruiting company, and they are worldwide. So they are recruiting all over the world. So any of you out there who are already in the industry and looking for maybe a different job or you're looking to get into the industry, maybe you're a student or maybe you have another job and you're looking at maybe a second career and you want it to be in additive manufacturing, 3D printing in some way, shape or form, you really want to listen up for all the details in this episode. Yeah. I mean, so you're definitely going to want to listen up because Jen has a ton of experience working in human resource management and recruiting for over 25 years. She's been in various industries, including OEM, which is original equipment manufacturing. So for those of you who don't know, that might be like building big, giant production 3D printers or things like that. So companies who do all of those things. And she's currently the principal for North America recruiting at Alexander Daniels Global. Because she's kind of got the vision from both sides, she has tremendous depth knowledge of what it takes to be a good candidate, as well as to building a good job description and for really searching for it. So she's really, I mean, in the right place at the right time too, because this is exploding. And our opinion has been that there is a skills gap. Yeah, yeah, we've been saying that for quite some time. We believe there's a skills gap. We believe there's All... more jobs than there are people to fill them with the right skills. Right. And for us, though, that's been, I would call, anecdotal evidence. We don't have the hard quantitative data to back it up. But we certainly, from everything that we've read and seen and everyone we've talked to in industry for years now, we believe that's the case. Well, now we're going to find out if that's actually true from someone who has the data. So let's go straight to Jen. Hi, Jen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. 
we've been a big advocate of the fact that there are lots of design and engineering and 3D print jobs out there going vacant or begging might be the case. And I finally have a person we can talk to to confirm that. Is there a gap, a job gap, a skill gap in additive manufacturing and 3D printing? There is absolutely a skill gap in 3D printing on a global scale. As you know, I am responsible for the North American market, but my team sees it equally in the EMEA APAC region. And that's with OEMs, service bureaus, distributors and resellers, production facilities, and of course, end users. Everyone wants the same pool of talent and there just isn't enough to go around. Wow. And what type of jobs are we talking about? What type of range of positions do you guys look for? We have been asked to find basically anything in additive from production or programmers, the people that program the machines, do post-processing of parts, whether it's metals or resins, all the way to C-level positions. But where we see probably the largest request is in sales and business development and R&D application engineering. R&D, yeah. Okay, that's an area that we have been told by other kind of business researchers is going to be an increasing gap area for jobs in the coming years. Their, I guess, theory is as more companies in the United States especially shift to additive manufacturing and are not manufacturing as many things perhaps in other countries as they used to be, they need more designers and engineers to develop those products. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. When dealing with additive manufacturing in terms of engineering, you are continuously upgrading machines, creating new machines, new materials, developing new processes, post-processing functions and how to save money, how to make it greener. There's always going to be what appears at this very moment, always going to be more and more research needed to make this a viable industry in the years to come and also to keep on this path of success. For example, metal printing. As we all know, metal printing has really taken over the headlines this past year, and more of the roles that were traditionally a mechanical engineer or a sales manager, they needed to have a sales background or a mechanical engineering background. With the metals coming more into play, what we're seeing is a strong desire to find people that have metal knowledge people that not only can talk about selling a printer that will print, say, in titanium, but that this sales manager understands what things can be printed in titanium, what are its properties, what are its limitations, and that's going to be a big skill gap. So really, on the sales side, you see that companies need people with real manufacturing knowledge of not just best practices, but how what, things are made. What capabilities are, yeah, in general. In order to help people, you've got to know what they can and can't do with it. That is true. The sales role seems to become more consultative as this industry grows. A salesperson may work in conjunction with an application engineer or a senior project engineer to better educate the client on the printer they're buying, the material they're buying, or the parts that they're buying from them. Interesting. And I would imagine the post-processing becomes a critical factor for a lot of companies. I mean, because if you're talking about implementing a manufacturing line or a production line for some product, and maybe it's even more so if you're setting up a service bureau that could be doing anything for anybody. But but right now I'm thinking about a company that's setting up a production line to, to make a product and Making the part is one thing, and that's incredibly important to be able to make the right part that meets the requirements. But then the finishing is really critical. Not everybody wants to create a finished part that, even if it's made of metal, is that raw material on the surface finish. So how much has post-processing and finishing become a part of companies' plans as you see it? Well, I think post-processing is very important because that's time being spent. You're paying people not just to run the machines and to do basic maintenance on the machines, but you're paying people, for instance, in polymer or resin printing, you need someone who maybe has a delicate touch to the parts so they don't break them. 
the support structure, how much of the support structure needs to be taken away, dissolved, or does it just print exactly as is on the build plate and you can simply pop it off? All of those contribute to costs and savings. When you get into metal printing, where we had subtractive manufacturing with, say, CNC and machining, now they're kind of playing in tandem with the post-processing of metal additive because it'll print the part, but it doesn't necessarily come out perfectly smooth or a great bottom or there's supports that have to be taken off. So you have to have someone who really kind of has experience, knows what they're doing there already. It would definitely be helpful. It is an area that I believe you can find as the new skilled trade. For instance, if you have someone who is very good with their hands, very detail-orientated, able to read blueprints, CAD drawings, things of that nature, it could be a great skilled trade to bring people into. And there are organizations currently addressing that. One instance is 3D Veterans, where they are working with veterans that are coming out of the service and putting them in boot camps to learn the skills to run the machines and to have gainful employment once they come out of the service. Well, that's fantastic. I'm very happy to hear that about the 3D veterans. That's something that is an area that Tracy and I have some interest in. Neither one of us are veterans, but we have family members who are. And certainly we see the big need in this country to help veterans transition to civilian life, and they may not have the right skills. Are you finding that companies are willing to train? I mean, I know you're saying this organization helps train people for these jobs, but are companies willing to train or do they generally not have the skills internally to train? Generally in production positions, I have found that companies will train candidates or new employees on the post process. They generally need to have certain skills to be selected for that role. So for instance, If I was hiring a post-processing person for polymer, I may look at someone who has done maybe computer repair, has fine motor skills, is very highly attentive to their detail, how well do they communicate, looking more for those outside skills to bring into additive. And then, of course, with metal, do they have any metal knowledge? Are they a welder? Did they take CAD in high school? Did they take welding in high school? That could be a great transition for someone that maybe is not looking to go to college, but definitely has some solid skills that would lend well to a skilled trade. Oh, I think that's really great that they have the vision to be able to say, hey, if they've got these, it should translate and we'll be able to do this with them. And I think that's fantastic. Does that mean, though, that you're having a resume is just not good enough anymore, and you need people to apply and, and show different things to you as they're applying. Some of the areas in recruiting an additive that you prove to be challenging are location. Mm-hmm. Additive manufacturing is still somewhat small in North America. It's not in every state to the point where we have major employers throughout the country. It's kind of like pockets of employers, you know, the Northeast up in Boston, down in Texas out in California, maybe down in the Southeast and South Carolina, and of course here Detroit and Illinois, but it's not so widespread that if you're a university student in Kansas and you took some additive classes that you're going to be able to put your resume out in Kansas and get the job of your dreams. Yeah, so really candidates may need to be willing to relocate or are companies willing Because there's this gap in skills, are they willing to help provide some relocation assistance for the right candidates? It really depends on the position and also the employer. Some positions can be remote where you could stay in Kansas, but let's say that you're a field service engineer and you travel 70 to 100 percent of the time. Or if you're a salesperson, you may work remotely. But of course, if you're an engineer or you're into a very customer-facing, maybe a customer experience center, you're going to need to be there. And so in some instances, companies have told us we will offer some relocation assistance. Other times we've had candidates be very upfront and say, I do not need any relocation assistance. What I need is a position in the career that I went to school for 
and I really want to get into additive manufacturing. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Are you looking at alternative industries for some of them? Like in the sales and marketing, that's what I'm sort of thinking, sales and business development. I mean, to me, when you have a sales job, it's not all that attractive in additive manufacturing right now because the numbers aren't there. So it's not a high growth in income sales. You're not going to be the stellar top seller. It's just not that kind of marketplace right now. It's an early stage growth. And so you need a different type of salesperson. And so are you looking at all complementary industries, other places where they might want to come out of like I'm in my mind because I, I know the industry really well, like textiles or something? Actually, in the past where I have been asked to find salespeople would be in capital equipment sales. Ah, that have sold large frame, heavy equipment, very large CNCs, things of that nature, people that are accustomed to a longer sales cycle. Sales and additive are generally not speak to a candidate in January, quote it in February, sell it in March, and it's installed in April. Yeah. When you get the larger machines, it could be six months to a year to close a sale. Yeah. So, so you need somebody with that kind of right level of understanding of what that sales process in cycle is. Exactly. I'd like to return to the post-processing for a minute because that's an area that I think is risky for a lot of U.S. companies because it can often get into a lot more labor. It can be a very labor-intensive process, whereas, you know, the wonderful thing about additive manufacturing is it's a machine making the part. Now, obviously, you have to handle the parts and clean them up a little bit. But if you're getting into a lot of finishing, you know, painting, plating, powder coating, or whatever it might be of metal parts, for instance, or even dyeing or painting of resin parts, do you see companies shying away from that? Or are they accepting and embracing that, realizing in order to provide the right product or parts, they've got to do the whole process? Personally, I believe up until this point, most of the parts that have been printed and post-processed have been small run samples, benchmarks for sales, things of that nature. But when we get into the future of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, the post-production is, I guess, the necessary evil. You're going to have that labor. You're going to have to, if you're going to make a point of printing, you know, hundreds of thousands of parts to go into different machines or airplanes or anything like that, you're going to have to invest in the labor side of it. Or in the so tech I, side of it. I mean, this is where I think innovation can happen. And if you don't have the right research and design team, you won't get to that. Absolutely. It all has to work together. If someone designs a part and orientates it the best way, when they prepare the printer, then there's less to post-process. Less supports is quicker processing. Less supports is a smaller chance of breaking apart as well. That's the way we design here on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> I think that becomes an R&D issue yeah. as much as anything. And orientation is one thing in the printer, sure. But I think when it comes to orientation, somebody with enough experience and knowledge will know there is one right best way to orient a part to minimize the amount of labor after you take it out of the machine. But I think when it comes to design and engineering of a part, there are many more opportunities to create a part in a different way, to create geometry that still will meet all of the functional and aesthetic requirements of the part, but because of its design, does not need supports in certain areas. I mean, that's at least a challenge that I take up when I design parts for additive manufacturing. Have you experienced companies looking for those kinds of skills? Absolutely. Everyone wants to make the most out of the time, the material. Material is not inexpensive. What they're looking for in R&D right now that we're being pushed for is more on the actual printer side, developing new ways of printing, improving the way machines are printing, maybe trying out new materials, what's going to work better. That seems to be the push right now on our side of the desk in terms of R&D and applications and what the companies are looking for. Hmm. So it seems maybe that development and industry in the U.S. is still maybe more on building the infrastructure for companies to engage more in additive. And we're not still a little ahead of the curve on companies that are deploying this technology and, like, as you said, manufacturing hundreds of thousands of parts using it, that maybe there still is, needs to be some more time and development before we quite get there. 
And I believe there are some service bureaus that are doing it, and they've been doing it for quite a while. But in the current atmosphere, it does seem that it's more of the OEMs of the hardware, materials, and software that are really focusing on the sales and R&D applications, in my opinion, on my books. I can understand that. And yeah. obviously, you're deep into it, but you're one company, and maybe that's an indication of what it's like in the U.S. market as a whole, or maybe not. But I would think at some point, if there's enough of a market there to support all of these companies developing these machines and materials, at some point it has to tip to being a little bit more of a consumption market than a infrastructure market. I definitely think that is the wave of the future. And that was one of the reasons why I left my position in human resource management with an OEM and went back into recruiting because I've done both over 25 years. I saw this coming a year and a half ago where we were shifting from strictly an OEM recruitment pool where people just kind of moved around between the OEMs. And I could see the service bureaus and the end users and the distributors wanting to hire the people that have been trained. Well, that's a very interesting opinion to understand. Yeah. I appreciate that. And actually, for what it's worth, my instinct, and maybe it's a little bit more than informed than just an instinct, but I'll call it instinct for now, is that you're right. You know, we've been exposed to owners of large companies that manufacture hard physical goods sold at mass market retail. And back even as early as, what was it, 2014, Tracy, I think, where some knowledge was shared with us of an owner of a, of a $400 million company that had been meeting with a lot of other similar-sized companies in the U.S. that are all involved in manufacturing, distributing of these types of goods. And they all saw that five, 10 years down the road that their companies are going to have to dramatically change if they're going to survive. And in the ways that you are talking about and seem to be experiencing. So I guess the anecdotal evidence, I guess, is all we really have, but would, right. would support. But you know, Jen, I just want to ask you, so, I mean, you've been in additive manufacturing for quite some time, so you obviously have a passionate interest and a knowledge of it. I mean, that comes across. It's not like you just sit there and look at a resume. You know what you need to be searching for. You know what skills this job requires. You've got a passion and understanding for that. Are you seeing that in candidates as well? And are you seeing people who just, I just so badly want to be in 3D printing? Absolutely. There is definitely a draw to this industry. It's new. It's exciting. The possibilities are endless. They see things that are on an emotional level with the bioprinting and the amazing things that we are doing with materials right now and the hardware and software. It's just amazing. And I think that gets people excited. And I get requests through LinkedIn from students, established people in additive, people that want to get into additive. I've yet to find someone that said, please find me a job outside of additive. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. They, they want to stay in it or they want to get in it. It's one of the two. You know, one of the areas that is probably the most challenging are the students now graduating or will be graduating in the next couple of years. It's only been recently that we've seen so many new universities and education programs really focus on additive as a career choice versus something that assists in an engineering program. Some of the issues that they're facing are they're not involved in anything outside of school. So what I always encourage them to do is really focus on their LinkedIn profiles, network with the proper people, attend the expos when they can, like Rapid or even AMUG or something along those lines so that they can be more involved in the industry. The industry is small, and it seems that people that have been in it, everyone knows everyone to an extent. Yes, that's so true. Right. So those are some of the things. The other areas where there are challenges, there are some exceptional candidates that are graduating that are students that would require sponsorship. OPT sponsorship for STEM is up to 36 months. Where else do you, besides, you mentioned LinkedIn, but are there directories in, in design? Well, for a long time in industrial design, graphic design, other areas like that, we've had Core 77 is a big directory where people post jobs and other things. 
I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. IDSA has their own directory as well. And I don't know much. Is there a directory out there for job listings and where people put their resumes up that are much more 3D printing and additive manufacturing associated? There isn't a specific website or listing that I'm aware of that lists just additive manufacturing. Of course, things get picked up on the standard Indeed, Glassdoor. They pick up listings generally that are online and you can find things there. Of course, LinkedIn. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. And you know, but I hear this from people all the time that when you apply for jobs on LinkedIn, they go unanswered. I have known a few people who were extremely qualified in marketing jobs and other things like that. And they just don't go answered. Is it because there's just so many applicants? I have to say that it's not even the fact that there's so many applicants. Sometimes what happens is when someone applies on LinkedIn and you're going through the profiles, if you will, depending on the position, it could be that that person is in San Francisco and they want someone in Boston. Ah. And they may say, no, this person needs to be, we really want someone local to Boston. We're not looking for a relocation. So it's just a mismatch in understanding between the listing and the candidate who applies. It could be. It very well could be. The other thing, too, is I love to tell candidates that when you see, let's say that you look at a particular company in additive manufacturing and they have five jobs listed on LinkedIn, If you go to their website, their career page probably has 10 jobs listed. And I would venture to guess there are probably another five to 10 jobs that aren't even written yet. (laughs) That they're about to write. (laughs) They're about to write. So what we tend to do as recruiters is we develop relationships with our clients and our hiring managers, and they share things about in Q1, we're going to be looking for two salespeople, or in Q3, we're going to be looking to add an R&D team or something along those lines. So as we are recruiting and looking at different candidates and networking, we have in the back of our mind, this is a job that could come up Hmm. or this person would fit really great in this company and their culture and their location and their background just needs to be there. And so we can make those introductions. So I think working with recruiters that are specific to additive manufacturing is definitely a positive way to approach it. I'm not speaking for all, but in our particular case, we only do additive manufacturing here. So all day, every day, seven days a week, I am focused on additive. Wow. Wow. That's a specialty, really. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It's a niche market, but because the market is so small, you really... It is a benefit to know as much as you can about it and who's in it and what the next steps are and who's laying off and who's hiring and who's acquiring who. And there's a lot to know. Yes, (laughs) there is. Well, and to me, the fact that you're focused on this full time is very telling in and of itself. If there's enough of a market that and I'm sure you're probably not the only recruiter in the country involved in this. Maybe the only one full time. I don't know. But I mean, there's there's got to be some others. But the fact that at least you are focused full time on this speaks volumes for the market and the opportunity and the jobs that are available and the people looking to get jobs there. Absolutely. And I think that just as with any company that uses a recruiter, you use a recruiter to find your best match, if you will, for what you're looking for. And You have to be talking to people all the time and know everything about your candidate. What makes them tick? Where do they want to live? Why do they want to be in metal? Why do they want to be in polymer? Could they do both? It's a constant conversation. And that's what our clients are relying on is that we know the people that we are submitting. Well, before we go, Jen, I was hoping maybe you would give us some actionable tips for our job seekers out there. The ones looking to beef up their LinkedIn profile, make sure their resume is attractive to a company like yours. What should they do? Oh, now you're going to ask me to share my secret. (laughs) I'm going to ask you to get good candidates. (laughs) So one of the things that I counsel candidates about are their LinkedIn profiles. Exactly that. A lot of times when you look at a LinkedIn profile in somebody within additive manufacturing, 
if you go on your laptop and you pull up your LinkedIn profile, your public profile, and you look at what everyone else is looking at before you scroll down the page or click the about me, what are you seeing? And many times there is no reference whatsoever to 3D or additive manufacturing in those first five lines of text. Oh, that is so important. You're right. And also I've been working with this amazing LinkedIn coach and you can hack your name. You can add 3D print expert to your last part of your name because there's extra characters in there. So mine actually says Tracy Hazard dash product launch expert. And that's legal. Yes. That's totally LinkedIn appropriate. They won't shut you down for that. So you should do that. (laughs) And when you have the about me, the first two lines are what show up. Mm -hmm. That first two lines, I would make it very specific to what type of role you are looking for in additive or the type of role that you are specialized in that a recruiter or a hiring manager would pick up on. Oh, such a good tip, Jen. And, and, you know, listeners, you guys got to understand is that people like Jen are really busy and they see hundreds of resumes and they're going through all of this or looking through many, many profiles. So what they see quickly, what they see first is what it's going to get them to pause and read more. I'd like to give you an example because I think it would be helpful for your listeners to understand the process a little bit. I receive a job order for one position on LinkedIn. I have thousands of first connections in additive. I do a search for this specific role in a geographical area and 800 and some plus profiles are populated. I then have to go through 800 profiles just on that initial search to find the key people that I want to follow up with. So when they say that a recruiter or a hiring manager is giving you that 30 second view on your resume, On LinkedIn, it's that first page. You want to grab someone's attention to say, oh, they're an application engineer, 3D printing, or something that draws attention to your profile. Wonderful tips. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming and sharing. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we go? Just one last thing. So Alexander Daniels Global, as I said, is centered on additive manufacturing. We conducted a salary survey specific to additive manufacturing globally. And we send that out for free. It's a PDF file. And it was very well received by both companies and candidates. And we are just now completing 2017. And it will be coming out after the first of the year, I believe. It goes over the APAC market, EMEA, North America, sales, R&D, software, And it's a great reference point, I think, not only for hiring managers to see where the salaries are, which, by the way, rose considerably since last year. (laughs) Because there might be a shortage of applicants. (laughs) There is no way any formal college degree education can really provide you with all of the skills that you need to be able to hit the ground running and be a perfect fit for any job that is out there that well, they're seeking to fill you know, today. We talk about this a lot back to our days when we graduated from RISD from Rhode Island School of Design. When we graduated and there was a computer lab that was and lots of CAD equipment that was donated by big companies who wanted to attract these young industrial designers and graphic designers and all of us in there, attract them to their software platforms, right? So that was the whole purpose of it. And it was a big lab that they put in, but it wasn't yet in the structural programs. There wasn't a lot of CAD usage. Yeah, no one was teaching you how to use it. It was not a requirement to to use it. Those of us that got into it had to take the initiative and do it ourselves. And I think that's a great example, Tracy. I mean, I, I think certainly CAD software is a very important part of this industry, but there's a whole lot more to it. Well, but my point that I was just about to make was that it was a time at which the faculty and the administration didn't know how to teach it yet. They didn't know how to incorporate it into their core structures. They didn't know how to add it into there. So that's what they were trying to get a handle on. And so if you look at that, if we had waited for them to get their act together and start teaching it, we would have graduated and we would have missed it. 
And well, so in fact, it wasn't available. It wasn't available the whole time we yeah. were there. So that's really where I see it is that, honestly, the fact that they're incorporating it into a curriculum right now is probably three years behind what is actually needed to be taught right now. And that's because it takes them that long to figure out how to integrate it into their structure. And then by the time they do and they agree on it, I mean, these are bureaucracies and administrative nightmares at most of these colleges and universities. Yeah. They don't move fast enough. No. And that's really where great that you're getting some exposure and getting basis for it, but you need more. I agree you need more. And your estimate of three years for some schools, maybe some schools that are really taking the initiative will be ahead of that curve. But I would even bet most schools it's going to take more than three years I, for their education I was being generous yeah. to be putting out graduates that have those skills that all these businesses need. I mean, I just think that this, the technology in this industry is moving too rapidly. Well, and, and, and the schools aren't attracting the right kind of teachers. That's another problem with that. Well, who knows how to who teach, knows how to teach it yet? Yeah, yeah. You know, so there really isn't places. It's a VR, AR, AI problem as well. You're talking about there is no place for you to learn the skills that you need. The colleges and universities are not moving fast enough for that. So there's a problem there. But there's also a retraining problem because where do you go to get new skills? And so a lot of this is on you. And that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast way back when. And it's one of the things that I really appreciate about Alexander Daniels Global and what Jen's doing is that they really have this vision that they want to enable the industrial revolution and additive manufacturing through talent. And you and I agree with that. I mean, that's sure. really what part of what we wanted to give you a place at which you could meet people, find tools, find tips, get networked, right? Because a network is an extremely important part of what Jen was pointing out. It's one of the key criteria. Find an, a broader network, expand out of your little town, your little maker shop, expand out of that and find a broader network of people who are doing things. Because when you do that, you accelerate your skills, you accelerate your position, you accelerate what you can do. And for us, that's what we call jump the learning curve. That's what we wanted to do here, right? Because if you were skill building on your own, we want to give you a broader reach of people and broader reach to things that are out there that might help you do that faster, accelerate you through that. Absolutely. And what's exciting to me about this market and while I know some students today, maybe either high school students looking to go to college or maybe people that are in college or those that are looking to get training for a second career that are already adults, you may be frustrated and disappointed that there isn't already an education system yeah. that's going to train you for exactly what you need because you're interested in it, you're excited about it, and you just want to know, all right, how do I do it? Where do I need to go? What do I need to learn? Well, that may be disappointing, but at the same time, to me, that's exciting because if I were in your shoes, I mean, I, I'm in a kind of individual that sees opportunity and takes initiative to take action on it. If you're like that and you have the motivation and will take the initiative to take action, really, you have the ability to go out there somehow, somewhere out in probably in your community, although Jen made some good points that there are more pockets, pockets yeah. of this technology in certain areas of the United States more than others. And that's probably true in other countries for those of you that are listening internationally. But anything that you do to go out and get experience in additive manufacturing on your own to further your own education is going to benefit you. So I would highly recommend you just go out there and get involved one well, way or another and then find a way to actually make that clear to anybody who would be researching you whether it's on linkedin or even facebook monster.com you know, whatever that you have indeed find a way to stand out above the crowd of people that are interested in this market and show what those special things are that you've been able to learn that special experience you've gotten or any particular areas of interest that you have, that you're taking that initiative is I think that will speak volumes and you will stand out and you'll get that phone call interview or that email or, you know, you'll get contacted by someone. A little informal yeah. research here and find out where maybe some of you see some gaps and right. things that you would like to be able to learn. Right. Anyway, we throw that out. So please give us some feedback on that. You can do that on the website in the comments field and or um, there's a form there at 3dstartpoint.com. You can also do that on social media at 3dstartpoint. 
and of course, please go to this blog post because connecting with Jen, connecting with Alexander Daniels Global, connecting and finding out when that salary profile comes out, which is going to be awesome. You definitely want to do all of that. And all of that will be in the blog post at 3dstartpoint.com. It will be. But I also want to emphasize that if you follow us on Facebook at 3D Start Point or any, what other social media channels are we really still uh, active in? We, we have Twitter, but we don't really. I mean, we, we make active. posts, but All that's right. about it. We do have Pinterest, All but right. it's at Has Designer. Well, Pinterest. let's say the recommendation here is Facebook to follow 3D Start Point on Facebook or on Twitter because, yeah, you're right. We will put this out there. But and if we you, are on LinkedIn. And this is what I want to say. You can follow 3D Start Point's business page, but you can also connect with Tom and I. We connect with listeners all the time on our LinkedIn. So thanks again for listening. And I'm so glad we were able to finally get someone to really talk about that 3D jobs and uh, the skill gap. And so I really appreciate Jen for coming on the show. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's something we could have done a year ago or two years ago as in earlier episodes of this podcast because no one had really concentrated as much as she has in it. But now, hey, this is great. Times have changed, new information, and we're bringing it to you. So we hope you found that fun and valuable. So thanks again for listening. This has been Tracy and Tom. On the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.